Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, hopefully you're having a good day so far and hopefully we can make it uh, even that much better. Uh, we have, a, uh, as I was mentioning, a really great duel of presenters and Jeff and Kyle will talk about them in just a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with the, just a couple very brief announcements before we get into the meat of the program. Um, so today's agenda, just kind of talked over it, a couple announcements, uh, then we'll go through location, 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 putting your data on the map with Jeff, and then introdu introducing Tableau Plus Coding uh, with the Tableau Coders Initiative, Kyle, and then uh, any kind of closing words at the end. Uh, so just a few simple, quick announcements uh, if you're interested and haven't registered so far. Uh, next month is the Dreamforce Salesforce Conference from September 20th through 22nd. If you're familiar with the Tableau Conference, it's similar in the in the way that it is both virtual and in person. So there is a portion of it that is made available for streaming. It's free, something to check out. Uh, I will be presenting there alongside uh, some other Tableau visionaries and people of the community. Uh, just We just wanted to call this out real quickly. If you haven't seen this before, if you've not subscribed to this, uh, this is a good call out of all the things that are happening in Tableau, the best of Tableau web. This is done each month, uh, pretty regularly done now by Mark Bradborn, used to be Andy Cogreve. Uh, definitely something I would encourage you to check out. We, of course, in these sessions can't call all the big and amazing things that the community has built. And this is your way to get that information sent to you pretty regularly. Um, and then finally, uh, just call for future speakers. If you have interest in speaking at one of these events, we're always looking for people to attend and join and speak about uh, the things that they do. Anything you, you think would be good for others to learn, you know, maybe something special in Tableau, maybe how you use it with another product, how you're using it at work, things like that. We're definitely open and uh, encourage you to reach out to us if you have any interest. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, our na names are down there, the leaders. Uh, just as a reminder, um, feel free to reach out to us on, uh, you know, wherever you can find us. And uh, honestly, aside from that, we're going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Jeff. Um, Jeff is just kind of like an introduction. Uh, you know, I think we can go on and on about it. Uh, Jeff is a VP of Information Technology and, and Analytics at Unifund. Uh, he is professor professor of data visualization at uh, University of Cincinnati. He's a five times Zen Master, Zen Master Hall of Fame. Uh, he's founder and leader of our fellow Ohio Tableau user group uh, in Cincinnati, and author of the Big Book of Dashboards. And I'm I probably just keep going, but Jeff, I'll pass it to you. Awesome, thank you. Just gonna share my screen again. I didn't work the first time. There we go. I think that'll work. And uh, as I get started here, I'm just going to put a list of links and references in the uh, chat window. Um, hopefully those will work. I can't ever remember if it's the HTTP or www. So I, I guess it didn't work quite exactly. You can't click on them, but you can at least copy them out of your, your chat window. Um, so those links are there for you. So um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Zach. Uh, this uh, session is going to just be on uh, mapping in, in general, and um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I am the professor uh, of practice at the University of Cincinnati, um, just joined full-time faculty as of uh, this week, uh, been in the financial services industry for about 27 years uh, at a company called Unifund, formerly their chief operating officer, uh, but now their uh, VP of IT and analytics. Um, I am a five-time Tableau Zen master, uh, which has been renamed in recent years to Visionary uh, and joined the Tableau Visionary uh, Zen Master Hall of Fame uh, in, in 2021, I guess it was, or 2020. Um, I am the co-author of the Big Book of Dashboards that Zach mentioned, and I do host a podcast with my co-authors uh, called Chart Chat, which uh, you, could, you could check out. Um, I am also a dog lover. Uh, I have three dogs. Also have cats now, which is really interesting for me, but um, two do three dogs and two cats uh, running around the house. And uh, that's Toby, who is uh, sitting next to me on the floor while I present. Um, I've been teaching at UC for about 10 years and um, have had over 3,000 students at this point. A lot of the students um, 
are international students, but uh, I have um, been teaching Tableau since the beginning of the course. I feel lucky that we picked it back in 2012. So all of the students that you see in our business college uh, go through that course and, and have had Tableau, um, which, is, which has been great. Um, the websites, I'll just blow through these because I gave you the links, but um, there's a Tableau reference guide. Uh, I need to get some posts updated on there with all the best of the web stuff, but there's like 900 uh, blog posts on there uh, that you can check out written by best of people in the community. Um, my website has a, a blog. I haven't blogged in a while. I'm hoping to turn that back on at some point, but a bunch of old blog posts there. I gave you two websites, one called tabcharts.com and one called tabtips.com. Um, the charts have like 33 or something charts. Uh, they give you directions on how to do them. And tab tips are just uh, sets of uh, I think 140 tips or something. I, I don't even know how many I've posted on there, but um, lots of Tableau tips. Uh, the big book of dashboards isn't related to, um, to Tableau necessarily. It's more about business dashboards, uh, but something you know that may be useful to you. You can check that out and uh, more information on the big book of dashboards.com. And finally, chart chat. I love chart chat. Uh, we do this once a month. Our next one will be coming up in September. It's free. We stream it to YouTube. We've had some amazing guests, including you know Ben Schneiderman, and um, we've had Tim Harford and uh, John Burdock, John Byrne Murdoch. Um, the most recent episode, uh, we had uh, Seth Godin, marketing guru and uh, author of the Carbon Almanacs. We've had some wonderful chats, and hopefully, have some uh, exciting guests coming up on our schedule. One of my favorites was Joss Fong, who did some amazing video production on COVID. So if you haven't seen that video that she did, it's amazing. Um, and the uh, she shows us behind the scenes in chart chat, how some of that stuff was created, which is really, really cool. All right, our topic today, maps. We've been mapping data for a very long time, like longer than we've been creating bar charts or, or any kind of uh, uh, data visualization. I mean, maps go back for um, hundreds and hundreds of years before any kind of visualization of data. Uh, early maps, we're just trying to get, you know, figure out where we are, right? What directions of things. Uh, and we didn't know how the world looked. And so um, some interesting images of that throughout the ages couple of these I, I own prints of and they're, they're really cool. Um, you know, looking at 1848, long before computers, mapping out 1500 rivers and 440 lakes and 40 waterfalls with careful original calculations. Pretty impressive what people were doing to try to map the world back then. Some famous maps that you may or may not have seen, uh, Dr. John Snow, not from Game of Thrones, but John's, Dr. John Snow um, has a famous, uh, cholera outbreak map of pumps uh, where water, and this was really interesting because when this was going on in the 1800s, people thought it was like COVID, right? They thought it was airborne, and, and he had this theory that it was in the water, uh, and it turned out that it was in the water. It was cholera that was in the water and, and through uh, contaminated pumps. Well, later on, he mapped this data, and it became a very famous map of his, his pumps, um, Charles Menard, which you may or may not have heard, uh, mapping things, uh, you know, in the 1800s. Uh, this is meat production in France, uh, or his more famous uh, Napoleon's uh, invasion into Russia that was a disaster. A beautiful demographic map done by uh, Adams and Kelly. These 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 two ladies create this beautiful detailed uh, map you know, mostly by hand, right? I mean, you're not, again, you're not using computers in the late 1800s to do this stuff. And house by house in Chicago, street by street, house by house, showing the ethnicity of, of each house in the neighborhoods and how they were coming together on the streets. Another famous one out of, uh, you know, the UK, um, London, uh, the London Underground, um, Henry Charles Beck for 50 years was mapping the subway stations. And even today, it's, it's mapped in a very, very similar fashion, even though they've added many stations. So we've been mapping data for a long time and lots of famous maps. Why are maps important? Well, uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, I guess I'd say a map is worth a thousand cells. Um, it's that you can relate disparate data. You can put lots of information on a map. You can easily spot areas of problems. You can look at it by state, county, zip, block, even down to address, 
And I'm gonna show you some maps that even go down to person where a person is moving um, even below an address. And so um, that can get really interesting. You can get some really detailed data of how people are, are doing things. We've all seen these shaded maps, choropleth maps, where you have you know, more or less of something, the unemployment rate or profit by state, um, a cities or, or locations of visitors. This is locations to my website, dataplusscience.com. Um, this one is hotel properties that was featured in the big book of dashboards and, and showing that across the world. I'm going to do a really quick video called 42 Amazing Maps. Hopefully the sound works for you. We tested it. Um, I think it's a, somebody who talks faster than I do, so it's kind of fun. Um, but he's going to walk you through a, a quick video, and then we'll pick up where he leaves off. Good morning, John. Today, I'm going to introduce you to some maps, 42 maps that help me understand the world and my place in it. Maps are an amazing kind of art. They tend to represent reality, but they don't have to. They can put lots of information into perspective. They can be extremely information dense, and I love information density, which is why I cut all the breaths out of my videos. Historical maps don't just tell you about the world. They tell you about the world that they were created during, which is really amazing. And not just what the world looked like back then, but also how little we knew about the world back then. When I'm reading Game of Thrones, I'm always super frustrated because they haven't mapped the whole world yet. And I'm like, if you go west from Westeros, what's over there? It's just amazing to realize that the majority of people who lived in the world so far didn't know what the whole world looked like. That just, it seems terrifying to me. But once we had the global maps, we started using them for more than just representing the world so you could navigate it or divide it up into things that were owned by different people and countries. It became an interesting and useful way to display and understand data about the world. Population probably being the most obvious example. Here's the world split up into seven different regions, each with about one billion people. And yes, that is North and South America and Australia just making up one of them. Australia is mostly empty. Only 2% of people live in the highlighted area. Inside this circle, there are more people living than outside of that circle. Actually, it's this circle because things get distorted when you take a globe and unwrap it into a flat rectangular map. Which is why this weird curvy line is actually the longest straight line you can sail without running into land. Here it is actually projected onto a globe. See? Straight line. The sailing route is only possible, of course, because the Earth is mostly water, which becomes more evident when you look at the places that you could actually make an Earth sandwich. By which I mean that there is actually land on both sides of the planet in those places. Maps can also show preferences of course, for alcoholic drinks, for sides of the road, for how to pronounce caramel or caramel, or what to call cola soda pop cokes or systems of measurement, and yes, the U.S. is lagging a little bit behind in the metric system there, also in maternity leave, also in executing juveniles. It's a little embarrassing. World Mapper is an amazing website and software tool that distorts the world based on data. Because really, is the amount of land a country has the most important thing about that country? Of course it's not. Here, the world is morphing from a map that shows the amount of land that each country has to the amount of people that each country has. While in this World Mapper map, we see the number of internet users swelling from 2000 to 2007. These moving maps that stretch to the dimension of time are some of my favorites. For example, this one that shows internet usage over a 24-hour period, and this one that shows global flights over a 24-hour period. Whoa. Now, as much as maps can help us understand the world, they can also distort our perceptions of the world. For example, the Mercator map projection, which we often use, stretches out the world at the poles. In this map, Africa looks like it's about the size of Greenland, but in fact, Africa is big. Very big. The continent of Africa is bigger than the United States, France, Germany, Spain, the UK, all of Eastern Europe, China, and India. What? Also, north being up is completely arbitrary. Uh, and it's kind of convenient, it turns out, because most people actually do live in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Western world, we started out with north being up, with Ptolemy, but then we switched so that east was up, so that when you said to orient, to orient your map, you were pointing toward the orient. We switched back to the north being on top because we got obsessed with the Greeks during the Renaissance, if you were wondering. We live in a big complicated world, sometimes wonderful, sometimes terrible, always impossible to understand completely. But the people who use these data and these tools to make these constructions of reality so that we can better understand our world are some of the heroes of the modern age. Hats off to them and to our ever-changing wonderful world. John, I'll see you on Tuesday. Good morning, John. Today. So, I hope that was fun. Um, 42 maps in like two and a half minutes or something on that on that video. Uh, I'm going to see if I can do 100 maps in the next uh, half hour. So he's, he's moving much faster than I will. You know, what's interesting is in in that video, lots of amazing things. Um, 
none of them, as far as I could tell, were done in Tableau, you know, uh, lots of different tools. Uh, I'll start out by saying everything that you're going to see today that I've created is, is pretty much a Tableau map, um, sometimes with Mapbox, oftentimes with Mapbox. Uh, embedded into Tableau. So as I walk through those, I'll, I'll let you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. I'm going to move my uh, chat window over here just in case you guys want to chat as we go. Um, you know, mapping challenges. Uh, you know, listen, we've been having challenges in maps for a long time too. So it's not just a, a modern phenomenon. I mean, mapping has to make, um, you just have to make compromises no matter what you do. But the other thing is just mistakes on maps. This is a Mitchell School Atlas from 1839, like the thing that teaches kids about, you know, school, right? Maps, like how to, how to read maps and how to understand the world. And there's this area on this map um, specifically called uh, the Mountains of Kong, right in the, in the center area there. And uh, the Mountains of Kong, or um, sometimes um, it has another name. Sometimes it'll say the Mountains of the Moon. Here's another map from 1815. You'll see it also has the Mountains of Kong or the Mountains of the Moon. Now, why do I point this out? Well, this is across Africa, this chain of mountains. Well, there, there is no mountain range across Africa. There, there is no Mountains of Kong or Mountains of the Moon. In fact, it has its own Wikipedia page about mountains that don't exist. And yet they were on, they were on maps for a hundred years. And in fact, I found maps even up into the 1980s that still had these mountain ranges on them. And, you know, our friends over at Fox News, uh, they published this out. Uh, the blog post is still out there, I believe. But um, I love this map. A friend of mine, you may not get it right away, um, but, you know, at least if, if you're in the U.S., especially if you're from the South, something's going to jump out at you. Um, you know, Missouri has invaded Arkansas and Mississippi and Alabama swap land. Um, because those aren't those states. And I don't know how that was mixed up on Fox News. Um, Bing, I checked Bing. It's a Bing map. They, they have it right. Um, I've never put a label in Tableau on a state and it messes the label up. So not sure exactly how that happened. There's other mapping problems, right? You look at the Electoral College. You say, oh, who won, the blue team or the red team? Well, the red has more land. So obviously the red team won, right? Well, no, they didn't because it's electoral votes. It's not the size of land, which they talked about in that video. So people have tried to solve that problem in different ways where, you know, maybe the size of dot matters. Um, and people have morphed it, a cartogram, and tried to change that. I don't particularly like that. There's a wonderful blog post about this by Ken uh, Flairledge. He walks through all the different examples. And uh, one of my favorites is done by Steve Wexler, uh, who put it as a tree map and easily can see that the blue team won because it's more than half. And if you want to make a precise comparison, you have your bar chart, but it has this, this tree map, which really isn't even a map, right? Not a geographic map. Another thing, if you, and we use this a lot, we don't, we don't use geographic maps too much at, at our company, at least in the financial services. Um, this is our complaints dashboard featured in the big book of dashboards. It's a hex map, a complaint in Rhode Island or Delaware or New York or New Jersey or Maryland. Um, or maybe Washington, D.C. that'll never show up on a, on a regular map. Um, it's just as important as a complaint in Texas or California where there's lots of land. And so having a, a view like that can be very useful. And you could do that as a tile map, or you can do that as a, a hex map or circles. Um, here's a tile map by Matt Chambers. Um, he did the most visited state parks. Um, and now we're embedding time series data as a area chart in this tile map. I thought that was really, really well done. I did one called, uh, will your state survive the zombie apocalypse based on some data that was on uh, the web. Uh, it was really just a list of states on the web. I said, gosh, we could do more than just a list of states. So I made it interactive where you could rank the importance and see based on whatever you thought uh, would be important, which state would be the best place to live in if the zombie apocalypse happened. Uh, this is not my, this is not Tableau. This is a, a map um, that I ran across the, the software, uh, soft drink, excuse me, soft drink names uh, by county. Uh, so about 45,000 counties, we can do that in Tableau, a very similar map in Tableau pretty easily. Um, but in the North, we tend to say pop in the South, more Coke uh, on the East Coast where I grew up, I say soda, um, pretty interesting map. What if the map areas are 
unique, very different. You know, you, you can't map this in Tableau out of the gate uh, because it's a custom boundary. It's a school district. And so we use these things called shape files. So this is a custom shape file in Tableau. Once you bring it in, click of a button, you can look at all of the school districts in Ohio uh, and which ones are performing better or worse. What about dots on a map? Branches of all of the banks in the United States. Um, and what's interesting about this, this is data is from a few years back, and I, I realize we have some Chase folks on the line coming from Columbus, but um, this is 96,000 bank branches in the US. And if I had you look at this, you'd say, oh, you know, I could call this the Verizon coverage map because it's really just a population map, right? But there's no map layer, it's just dots on a map. But if I apply some filtering to it, all of a sudden we see the top 10 banks by branches, Wells Fargo or JP Morgan Chase, where your branches are, or moving down PNC or other banks, Fifth Third, uh, headquartered here in, in Ohio that obviously has a presence in, in Columbus and, and throughout the Midwest. We can now see that and, and now it becomes useful just based on some other things. Or imagine a bank wanted to acquire another bank. One of these banks did get sold. Um, but, you know, imagine looking at that. Well, you can see the geographic locations of those branches and say, yeah, if I'm U.S. bank, maybe I should have considered acquiring SunTrust or TD Bank to expand my, my, my scope or my area. This is a dashboard of a company we worked with in Cincinnati um, that I helped on, on the project, but they wanted to look at their uh, manufacturing floor productivity. And so, you know, blue, good, red, bad, uh, where on the floor. And so we, we mapped out their, their operations and, and, and did that. This is bad swipes at, at the building at Unifun where, uh, where I work. And uh, the employees come in the back door, minute by minute, you can see the bad swipes uh, coming in. There's also visitors coming in the front door, but most people come in the back door. You can see the cleaning people come in later in the evening. This is a project that uh, the University of Cincinnati did with the Cincinnati Zoo, looking at their active memberships versus dropped or lapsed. We do have members from Columbus, as you can see, and Indianapolis, but most of them from the Cincinnati area. And if we look at Cincinnati, blue being active members, you know, from the higher income areas, um, or areas, you know, this area in Clifton over here is higher uh, income areas. This area down here in Clifton, uh, where the university is, is more transitory. Students come. Um, and the brown dot is where the Cincinnati Zoo is. This is a, one done by our city of Cincinnati. They use Tableau and they have a team down there of some folks that build some dashboards. And when the heroin epidemic started to happen, they started to build some dashboards out on this data. And one of our Cincinnati Tableau user group guys that you may know by name, um, his name is Spencer Bauke. He took this, uh, Spencer took this data and he built this. He took their data and said, well, let me see what I can do with it. He actually used to work at the city of Cincinnati too. Um, and so he took their data and built this beautiful story uh, around the heroin epidemic. I mean, sad story, but showed when it started to hit Cincinnati, the neighborhoods that it, it hit, and even mapped it down to, again, dots on a map where uh, this data was coming from. My good friend, Alan Walker and Anya Ahern, did a presentation for the Cincinnati tug and they took our heroin data in Cincinnati. Alan uh, used Mapbox and, and did a heat map. Then he plotted the police stations. This is Tableau with Mapbox. He uh, plotted the police stations nearest driving distance through an API and then looked at hospitals nearest driving distance to a hospital. And what's interesting there, I mean, you can kind of see downtown a lot of heroin um, you know, incidents downtown near a hospital, but a big area over here on the east side of Cincinnati where we had a lot of uh, incidents and um, not near a hospital. The three of us, Alan, Anya, and I did a presentation at 2015 to the Tableau conference. And uh, we took data from, um, from San Francisco's crime uh, data we found drug incidents in their crime data and we embedded a Google map uh, with our Tableau Viz map box map in the background and um, made it interactive with Google Street View so we could explore the crime. And for that conference, we also took all the conference attendees in 2015 and said, hey, it's an attack on Area 51, just for fun. Um, again, this is a map box map in Tableau with play control, time lapsed uh, and recorded the screen. 
This is all flights out of Cincinnati and where they land and where you can fly from there. So connecting flights from Cincinnati, one connection from Cincinnati and where you can fly um, just based with flight pass. This is a viz I did a, a few years back. Uh, you pick whatever airport you want. You can pick um, Cincinnati or, or Columbus or Atlanta or New York or whatever. And in uh, without a connection, direct flights from that airport, it'll tell you where you can go. And when you land, it shows you all the dots in that state for all the campgrounds. Uh, and uh, once you've selected your dot, you can also get information about that. For example, the Utah Strawberry Bay here, and you can see sort of an aerial view of that. Here's a thing I built in Tableau, geo midpoint using set actions. If you wanna select points on the fly, it'll calculate where the center of those points would be. Imagine you had customers and you wanna build a, a branch or you wanna build a restaurant or uh, you wanna move offices or, or whatever. Um, you might wanna be you know, where your employees are, or where your uh, customers are. Um, I have a blog post on that one. Somebody had on the Tableau forums, can we find the, uh, the closest uh, measure to the ocean. And uh, so that's what this is, not including the Great Lakes. I plotted the ocean boundaries. And uh, when you select points on a map, it'll tell you um, what is the closest uh, with birds, birds, bird's eye, bird fly, um, where it is. This is a radial map before we had buffer in Tableau. You can pick a point and select whatever your radius is. This is actually easier to build in Tableau now than years ago. You can use the buffer calculation, um, but I built a little satellite view in there as well and a pop-out window so that you could drill down and see at whatever level um, what, that, what that radius is. And then clustering points together that uncluster as you drill down. Um, again, I have a blog post on this and, and some visits on that on my Tableau public page. Average commute time by zip code, literally 45,000 zip codes at a click of a button in Tableau, pop, and this, this came up. You can find Atlanta and uh, Cincinnati, but compare that to Los Angeles where traffic is, is terrible. This took like two minutes to build in Tableau, probably not even, right? Once you have the data by zip, you double click zip code and color your map, right? That easy. Uh, this is an interesting one. Josh Tapley built this um, many years ago and, and was looking at mortality rates by, by things in the country. And his cancer map, it was a small multiples viz that you can check out, but his cancer map caught my attention because of the hotspot down in Kentucky. And so I took his viz, I filtered it, and I filtered to the state, and I started diving into this. And I said, well, what's going on with cancer in Kentucky? Like, why, how is this possible? Like a 50% increase in, in cancer in this area um, in that time period. I was like, that's really interesting. So I started diving into that. I looked at life expectancy and sure enough, I don't know where Owsley's County is, never been there, but you know, 10 years life expectancy different from 30 miles up the road. And uh, so Fayette County, like closer to Cincinnati, you know, 78 year life expectancy, but 10 years less just down the street in, in Owsley County, why? Um, I looked at smokers. I was like, okay, well, let me check out percent smokers. Smoking causes cancer. Maybe that would do it. Um, and sure enough, there are more smokers in the lower eastern quadrant of, of Kentucky. And then I pulled up a map of the area. And I kid you not, this is the image that I saw. And I, I didn't really know what I was looking at. I'm like, that, that's a truck. What is that? And then it dawned on me oh, that that's a coal truck. And so I went on Google Street View. And I moved around and I kid you not, the Google streetcar follows that coal truck for 20 miles down the road. Like, what is the chances of that? Like, I mean, this is coal country and that's what I didn't realize. So of course, lower Eastern, you know, Kentucky, you're, you're, you're where coal mines are. And, you know, we could go on and on and on with this video of the, of the Google streetcar literally following the coal truck down the street. I thought that was really funny, but also sad in that, you know, coal is so prevalent that the Google streetcar actually watched it happen. Um, so I mapped the coal mines. These are surface coal mines in the area of West Virginia and Kentucky there. And then I went and got all of the coal mines and plotted Owsley County and where the, where the cancer rates are. And you know, sure enough. Now, I'm not going to say that's the only reason, right? I did find online, if you smoke and work in a coal mine, the chances of 
catching cancer, I mean, they're astronomical. So, you know, could be related to that. But this is mapping data, right? And by the way, easy to do, all in Tableau, clicks of a button and, you know, put them on a map. This is a shape file of all the US rivers and streams in the United States. I did this in under three minutes. I have a blog post, double click the shape file and custom, customize your map. Uh, small multiple done by the New York Times. I didn't create this one, but I love it. Uh, got inspiration uh, you know, for creating a map for the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. We probably all heard about that, but you know, some areas, some streets, dark, bad. The light area neighborhoods, not so bad. So they, they had clean water, but some of these darker areas, those streets were hit pretty hard uh, in those areas. This was a real project for a worldwide uh, banana company, uh, a lar one of the largest banana companies. And uh, you can grow bananas in a couple of different places. You, for interesting fact, you don't get a lot of hurricanes uh, in the Southern hemisphere and almost none, um, virtually non-existent in South America. And, um, you know, you can plant bananas here and you can plant bananas here. Um, now, sure, there's other reasons, government and corruption and all other farming kind of things, but the, the project was related to, to this. All of the buildings in Cincinnati is a shape pile in Tableau, huge shape pile, by the way, uh, sidewalks in Cincinnati. Uh, we have a repository. I'm sure Columbus has one too. All of the shape files um, are available. Uh, Cincinnati, City of Cincinnati has an open data repository. Not sure if Columbus has one, but all of the traffic accidents around the University of Cincinnati. I called this viz the young and the reckless. Kevin Flairledge and I um, collaborated on this viz last year. If you were around, you, you probably had them, the, the cicadas, because they, they did reach up to Columbus, uh, at least uh, according to my map. And uh, we, we mapped this out in a story about the cicadas. Um, you know, interesting enough, uh, the, uh, the map was a smaller piece to it, but we did, we did build a, um, two maps for this. And um, you can download this on our, on our Tableau public page. Wonderful open data. Somebody posted your open data for Columbus. So I would encourage you to go check it out and you can do this kind of stuff. This is snow plows. We have GPS on all of our snow plows. So we know where and when they are. And the city of Cincinnati actually publishes it uh, hourly as they're clearing the streets through a Tableau server so that people can see where the snow plows are. Uh, we live in the city of Seven Hills. I mapped uh, that with um, Mapbox and showed the elevation all the cell phone towers in Cincinnati. This data is available worldwide. It's a huge data set and uh, uh, available for any city, but kind of looks like the Stranger Things map, but you can kind of see the coverage of the cell phones going up the highways versus rural areas. This project is something I did for a uh, top five or 10, top five, I guess, uh, mobile company, cell phone company. They buy antennas from auction and uh, they wanted to map their antennas the antennas that they were looking at, they're not all the same shape. And so we built, I built this in Tableau for them uh, so that they could go look at their antennas and the shapes of those antennas and uh, plotted them on a map as well, just to kind of see what they would look like. Parking signs in New York City, 231,000 parking signs that are published by the state, the city of New York. I mapped those just to see, I call it the city that never sleeps. Um, this was a week of, of gun, guns in the news um, that just got my attention and I felt like I should uh, visit. I did it with a Deer Data project, Deer Data 2, and uh, decided to map it. Another three minute project, all the submarine cables uh, as a shape file pulled into Tableau to show you how the internet, you know, our internet is connected through sub cables and uh, satellites. And so this is all the submarine cables around the world in a map box map. On the left-hand side, all the shipping traffic coming into the east coast of the, uh, of the U.S., hour by hour, day by day. On the right side, minute by minute, time-lapsed on New Year's Day in 2007. Um, I saw this uh, uh, something similar on Twitter, and I said, hey, this would be cool to reproduce. So I built a map box map in Tableau, play control, and I time-lapsed it using a tool called Camtasia. That'll lead me to some others just to kind of, you know, finish up in the in the last uh, 10 or 12 minutes here. Um, Beautiful Trash was a viz that I did back in 2017. This is GPS data from the city of Cincinnati for the trash trucks. 
literally moving minute by minute through the city on my trash day, which is Tuesday. Um, so March 15th, the trash trucks are moving um, through the city. And as you, you, this is on YouTube, you can check this out, you know, on your own or, or the, the Viz if you want to play with it. Um, but it kind of maps out a beautiful route. They kind of go up to the dump, you know, to, to empty the trucks. And then they, they later come back. I decided to build this into a Viz called Beautiful Trash. Um, where people could interact with it and play with it and, and see the trash routes on their trash day. My trash is, is picked up on Tuesday, uh, but you know if your trash day was Thursday or Friday, um, it, it's a different, different route. I also did something similar when, um, you know, look, we, we all live, you, you know this from Columbus, we live in the swing state, right, of an election. Ohio is a swing state. Uh, Columbus, uh, I don't probably like Cincinnati is a swing city. And uh, I wanted to look at that. And, you know, it, it's a people talk about it in a, in a very top level sort of, hey, we're a swing state or we're a swing city. We're about 50-50 or just a little bit more, right? Well, I decided to look deeper into this. And I mapped every house in the city with their uh, registration data, who are they registered uh, party. Um, I did use a pie chart on this one, by the way, for those of you who know I teach data viz and hate pie charts, you know, I, I did. A slightly more democratic, you know, in, in overall. But I, what's interesting about this, if you look at it, you know, we it, it's not consistent in the city, right? Downtown areas, as you move out to the suburbs, it really turns red. And so that tells an interesting story. And so I looked deeper and I said, okay, well, here's the west side of Cincinnati. Here's the east side of Cincinnati. Here's a street that divides it. Here's a house. And so I went through those stories to tell the West Side story, right? That Glenway Avenue really separates the Democrat neighborhoods from the Republican neighborhoods. And, and you see areas that turn purple there, but really that's, that's interesting, right? On the East Side, the highway kind of separates it. Then I look at in, into a neighborhood. That red line is Norwood, a city of Norwood within Cincinnati. And that city of Norwood is much more Republican, where if you cross the street and you go into Bond Hill, immediately everybody is registered Democrat. And then I looked at my neighborhood, my street, and said, gosh, nine neighbors on my street live in a purple house, a house divided. One person in the house is registered Democrat, and one person in the house is registered Republican. And one of those is my, my dearest friend, my wife's best friend, uh, lives in the, in the purple house next to that apartment building. She is a, a, a registered Democrat and, and her husband is a re registered Republican. Imagine every four years having to deal with that, right? And here's a bigger story. The pie chart really isn't 50-50. This is why it's a swing city because there is more than half the city that is not registered as a Republican or a Democrat. They're probably like me that thinks both parties are crazy um, and uh, you know could vote in any direction. And this is why the direction of the election moves all the time. And so that's a long form viz, a lot of maps there. Again, map box maps, all built in Tableau. That viz is on uh, Tableau public as well. This is device location data um, in Cincinnati. <clears throat> this is minute by minute people moving. I mean, if you're not familiar, you have a cell phone in your pocket, you download apps, those things have your location. People track those locations. They know where you are. They may not know who you are personally. Of course, some people do. Um, the FBI and, and, uh, and Google sure do. Um, but other companies know you anonymously and can, and can also look at you anonymously. Well, this is the movement of those cell phones minute by minute. And uh, I realized January 1st was a Saturday. I saw a lot of activity in downtown Cincinnati as the day progresses. And so I said, wow, I'm going to take a look at that. And so I started looking at that. And it is a game day, four o'clock Reds game. The bars around the Reds uh, ballpark start to fill up and they go to uh, the bars. And then at four o'clock, the, the stadium is packed. There's also an event over on the river at the Cove, um, some music event or something going on. And uh, when the game's over, everybody leaves. Now, this is Mapbox map, Tableau, play control, time lapse using Camtasia, just like everything else I showed you. The next one I'm going to show you is not Tableau. So I want to tell you that before you see it. This is using a free tool called Kepler GL. Uh, one of the uh, Hall of Fame visionaries, Christy Martini, did build a tool to put 
uh, Kepler in Tableau, um, but this is Kepler. And uh, I took the same data in Kepler GL and mapped it in that way. And if you're interested in doing this in Tableau, Christy Martini has a good blog post on it. And I think it works for Mac. I don't think it works for PC, um, but you can embed Kepler GL inside of Tableau and get maps like this. And I lit the whole city up at the end just to see where everybody was moving. Thought that was fun. And last but not least, uh, this is the age of every property in Cincinnati. We were founded in the 1800s and uh, I built a viz. I think it works in static form. In fact, it's uh, Kevin and Danushki had it printed on glass for me as a present and, and it's hanging in my UC office. Um, but uh, you know what's interesting is the interactivity, diving into the neighborhoods, seeing which streets are new and which are older. The older streets are, are yellow, the newer streets are darker purple and blue, um, and even down to houses. And, and, and you really kind of dive in and see the age of these houses. Um, the story to me really comes out when you animate it. And I have no idea what Tableau Public did. My viz on Tableau Public, Danushki told me this week that it's broken. Um, the animation on YouTube doesn't play anymore. So I don't know what Tableau did there, but the viz is on Tableau Public and the animation is on YouTube. Um, but here's our city founded in the 1800s, German ancestry, just like, you know, the German district in, in Columbus. Um, we found it, it that, that's the, the Rhine River in Germany, right? They called the Ohio River the Rhine. And so the area in Cincinnati is called Over the Rhine. They started moving out into the suburbs, uh, moving up into Clifton where the university is. And then, you know, we get to World War I. You can still see it's building out, but the phenomenon happens after World War II where we get modern day suburbia when the, they come home from World War II. And that's when it bursts out into, into the suburbs, right? Everybody moves out. Levittown and everything goes crazy. And that continues all the way into the 80s and the 90s to the point in, in modern history, we, we don't have much farmland between Cincinnati and Columbus anymore. It, it almost goes straight, straight up. And uh, so that is um, coming of age of Cincinnati, building by building. Again, all of these were built. Pretty much everything you've seen was built using Tableau, Mapbox, and play control for animation. Uh, and then sped up again using Camtasia. Uh, that's my tool of choice, but there's some free tools out there as well. And uh, with that, that's my presentation. I hope that was interesting to you. You can kind of see what you could do with maps, specifically in Tableau. Happy to take any uh, questions that anybody uh, might have. Thank you so much, Jeff. I know we have one out in the comments or um, in the chat from Carolyn. She says, I have the big book of dashboards and the big picture. Both show what you can do, but neither show how to do it. Are there any books you can recommend that show how to do different things in Tableau? Oh yeah, lots of good how-to Tableau books. I, I would go to, uh, man, so many to choose from. Um, I'll start early on, uh, you know, Dan Murray and Ben Jones had Tableau books early on that I like, you know, the more modern books in Tableau that I, I'd probably point you to would be uh, Luke Stanky and, and uh, um, uh, who's the co-author with Luke? Somebody help me out. Uh, Ann, Ann Jackson. Um, they have a book on Tableau. Uh, and uh, Ryan Sleeper, love Ryan Sleeper's book on, on Tableau. That's awesome. Josh Milligan has a great book on, on Tableau, all how-to books. Uh, so I, I'd recommend um, all of those. Um, yeah, and, and there's, there's, there's many more, but th those would be three that I would recommend on, on specifically how-to in Tableau. All right, the next one comes from Shori. Sorry if I screwed that up. What about seamless integration with Esri? The majority of local government's GIS platforms are, are in Esri environment rather than open source platform. Yeah, um, there's other ways to integrate in it. So this is going to be an it depends answer. I hate those, but you know, it just kind of depends on what you're doing, right? So some of the maps that you saw were shape files. You can you can export shape files out of Esri. Um, and, and that's how many people get their shape files. They use a tool like Esri or ArcGIS or Geoda or something like that, and they export out the, the shape file and then they bring it into Tableau. So you can do custom mapping outside. Um, 
if uh, we don't want to use shapefile, it's static data. Um, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you about what exactly you mean. I mean, if the data doesn't change, then you know, you're almost just using an image. I, I, I'm not. I guess you're trying to create an interactive map with uh, mapping data. Um, I we have the answer is it's possible. We we I did a project with NCRC with Kevin Flairledge, and we we used an Esri map um, and and brought that into Tableau. You know, as sort of layers in there. So it's it's possible to bring things in you know, layers, um, you can connect that stuff through Mapbox. There's lots of different different things that you could do with that. But feel free to reach out and I, I can walk through your scenarios with you if you have more questions on that. Are there any more questions for Jeff? There's a list of books I just dropped in the uh, chat window, uh, which includes Luke and Anne, um, Lorna Brown, I forgot about her book, awesome, uh, Ryan Sleeper, love his book, and then the two, uh, two or three older books, Josh has been out for a while, um, so yeah, you can, you can check those out. Is there an open source for that cell data? Yes, um, I can't remember where I got it. Um, I want to say Alan Walker posted something on Twitter and I saw it, but yes, it's, it's open data, giant file, by the way. I mean, giant, cause it's cell data from all, I mean, like you wouldn't be able to bring in the U S into Tableau. It'd be ginormous. So, um, but yeah, you can filter it to your city like I did um, or your state or whatever. Um, and if I can drum that up, uh, just, just ping me. I'll put my uh, email in here as well. One thing I wanted to shout out. So uh, we had somebody appreciate it post the uh, Columbus data. Um, where to go? Uh, somewhere in here. I don't know. I can't find it. Um, but if you do build something with the Columbus data, definitely let us know in the leaders, and we'll post that out and and celebrate that on one of these sessions. And since I'm unmuted, thanks, Jeff. That was great. All right. Um, so <clears throat> I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Kyle Massey. Um, Kyle is a VP within the JP Morgan Chase Tableau Center of Excellence. Um, he is a development lead focusing on automation and UX. Um, he built an automation tool used by thousands of developers at the company, saving millions of hours. I'm not exaggerating saying millions, I don't think. Um, You're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, in time getting um, dashboards up on the server. And he is an alumni of the Ohio State University and should be very familiar with all the maps that he that we just saw because he is originally from Cincinnati. So with that, I will turn it over to Kyle. Thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, and Jeff, I just want to say I'm a map nerd, a, a huge map nerd, and I love that whole entire presentation. So um, while I get my screen sh up sharing here, I shared a couple links um, that I'm going to refer to a couple times throughout this. So if you want to follow along, feel free to jump on or click on those. And um, can I just get a confirmation that you can someone can see my screen? Yep, all good. All right. Thanks, Zach. So um, again, my name is Kyle Massey. Uh, I am located in Columbus, Ohio, and I um, am in the Tableau CP, uh, COE at J.P. Morgan Chase, along with Zach and formerly Heather. Uh, I am also the co-lead of the Tableau Coders Initiative uh, Tableau User Group. Um, we have been on hiatus for a few months uh, while Zach um, welcomed his second baby, and we are actually going to get started again in September. Uh, with our uh, new sessions uh, focusing um, on some other API functionality. But today, what I really want to speak about um, is how do we get started with coding in Tableau? If, you're, if you have no experience whatsoever, um, talking a little bit about what you can do, how you can get started, what are some of the resources that are out there? Um, so all I kind of skipped, uh, Heather gave most of this information in my introduction. 
Uh, I will just add, I'm also an animal lover. Uh, we have a dog named Kevin and a cat named Willie, and I'm actually surprised that the cat hasn't been in here yelling at me yet. He usually makes an appearance every time I have to do one of these. So, uh, so what is, just a little bit of background on what our coders initiative um, is, uh, our user group is. So Zach and I were talking uh, about, uh, there's a lot of user groups that focus uh, on how do I make this viz, best practices, lots of blog posts that you see, uh, lots of really healthy conversation about uh, that sort of thing. One thing you don't always see the same amount of conversation with, at least in our experience, was developers and developing tools to use with Tableau. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things depending on your the kind of work that you do or the industry that you're in. Um, specifically at a bank, we have a lot of challenges regarding uh, users being able to perform certain actions and how can we animate that so they're not waiting for manual touches and things like that. So our goal with uh, the Tableau Coders Initiative is what you can see on the screen here, um, is we just we want to teach others how to code with Tableau and the tools uh, that they might need and you know keep it keep it safe and friendly. So no judgment. Um, when we started this, we set the expectation of you've never had to write a line of code in your life. Um, so if if that's where you start, we want to make everybody feel comfortable for true beginners all the way up through experts. So just to plug one of the links that I sent, um, I sent a link to our GitHub repository, which if you look at it is kind of structured session by session. Um, but if you go through in order the way they're labeled, you can kind of see how we start with virtually nothing. We start with just making very simple API calls and kind of seeing how um, results are passed back and forth when you make these kinds of things, um, all the way up to something that I'm going to demo at the end is just creating a project and a user and a group all from scratch in about 30 seconds or less. So um, second thing that I'll point out is the datatheories.com, which is actually Zach's website, but he is hosting uh, our Tableau Coder site there as well. Um, we have links to all five existing sessions, uh, the slides, the GitHub code, and the YouTube videos. Um, and like I said, we'll be kicking these off or kind of restarting this series in September, and we'll continue to post all of the goodies uh, there. So as we continue to grow, that list of events will grow right here uh, on this page. We also are uh, on the Slack channel for Tableau developers. So if you have development questions, if you want to reach out to me or Zach or any of, of the other uh, robust community of developers, I encourage you to click on that link and join the channel. Um, I'm on there all the time, just talking with people, answering questions, bouncing ideas back and forth. Uh, we'd love to see you. So let's start with one of the probably most important things uh, to get out of the way if you're really interested in, in beefing up your development skills with Tableau is you want to join the Tableau data developer, data dev program. Um, and you can see there, uh, this is the mascot for the program. Um, and if you visit go Tableau slash developer, which let me jump out and I will show you here, you can uh, sign up for what they call a developer sandbox site, which is a, a site um, that functions just like any other site. So if I go into developer sandbox, new site, this is where it'll have me fill out some information. I'm already logged in. If I weren't logged in, it would ask me to fill out some information if you don't already have a tableau.com ID. Um, and then you'll get an email uh, shortly after with a link to your site. Um, and you can you have full functionality over things like the REST API, uh, Metadata API. Uh, this is really a, a nice gift from Tableau to developers to where I can do some of this stuff in an environment that I have full control over. I can you know come and go, delete things if I need to. I don't have to worry about messing anything up if I'm like trying to learn with my servers at work, which is not always a great idea. Um, so I would highly encourage anyone who wants to go down this road to start here, get your developer sandbox set up. Um, and then everything that we talked to about after this, you can just uh, use your own site uh, and you know you don't have to worry about interacting with anything else. So how can we get started with coding in Tableau? Um, so there's a few things I want to talk, walk through some of the tools that you'll need to get started. Some of these might be familiar to some people. Um, others might be brand new. Um, but as I mentioned, you want to get your, your online sandbox set up at tableau.com slash developer. And then there are three tools um, that I'm going to talk about here really quick that are really important. Um, and these are, again, preferences. There are other ways that you can accomplish some of the same things. 
I'm not going to necessarily go through the installation and setup because this is kind of a condensed version. But if you are interested in seeing a little bit more about how to install each one of these from scratch, they are all in the first recording on uh, datatheories.net slash Tableau, co uh, Tableau coders. So the first one, we're going to talk about configuring your system. So what does a coder need? Code implies something. So we need a programming language. And if you're you know, at the highest level, if you're not familiar, it's basically a set of commands and instructions and syntax. You think of it like a living language. Um, and basically, you're telling a computer what to do, what to return to you, what actions to take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the course, or sorry, for the purposes of T TCI, Tableau Coders Initiative, we're sticking mostly with Python. Um, Python is probably familiar to most people on this call if, you, if you're uh, familiar with software development at any level. Um, Python is very popular for its readability. Uh, it's very easy to pick up quickly. Um, it's very popular. So there's a, there's a huge Python community. It's one of those, if you're Program. If you're if you're a coder, you're very used to googling problems. So picking a language that is very widely used means you will often find people have already solved the problem you're having. Um, so Python is is my preferred language. You you can do a lot of this stuff in in any language that can make API calls. Um, so it, it really is a preference. But if you are brand new to this, I would probably recommend starting with Python. There's a lot of resources uh, free. Uh, that you can you can get started with online with you know starting from absolute zero. So the next thing, and this is a very important thing that you're you're going to need, is what's called an IDE. It's an integrated development environment. Uh, it's basically an application that you use to write code, and it'll usually be integrated with your terminal, uh, so your your command line uh, instructions. It may suggest things for you or highlight things for you perform what's called linting, which is where as soon as you save, it goes and suggests some formatting based on readability or other standards um, that come with the piece of software that you're using. Um, and as I call out in the second bullet is, this is strictly a preference thing. I mean, if you really get into coding, you know, there are days when I spend all day in my IDE. So it has to be something that you like. Uh, so there are several that you can try out. Um, our recommendation uh, for the for the coders initiative was Visio, Vis, Visual Studio Code, which it is a Microsoft product. So I hope that doesn't scare anybody away. Um, but it is it's free. It has huge community support and thousands upon thousands of extensions uh, to do just about anything that you want from code snippets to um, in colorizing things to make them more readable as you're going through through things specified or a specialized autocomplete. So if you're familiar with something like React or Vue.js, um, you can download code snippets to where all you have to type is three letters and it will start a component for you from start to finish. So uh, again, a preference thing. And I, in the appendix of this of these slides, I do list some others. So maybe I can have Zach post those somewhere um, if you want to try more than one. And then the, the last tool that I'm going to talk about today and then show a little bit uh, a little bit later on is called Postman. Now, Postman lets you make API or HTTP requests uh, locally without having to really write code first. Uh, most developers who deal with APIs will use Postman while they're developing to test things and make sure that they're working. Uh, that they've got their bodies formed correctly and all of that uh, before they put it into code. Um, and it's a good one to kind of follow the bouncing ball as you go through and try to make all, uh, make all your calls work in the right order or accomplish what you're trying to do. So those are the tools that I would recommend starting with. And again, if you want more details on how they look when they're installed and what versions are available, check out the first video posted on uh, Data Theories, uh, our Tableau Coders website. We go through and actually install each one. All right, so let's talk a little bit about API. So it's, API seems like one of those terms that it gets thrown around a lot and most people know like, oh, I got my data from an API. What, is, what does that actually mean? Uh, and if you're not familiar, API is short for Application Programming Interface. And there's a, the analogy that I like to think of what an API, the purpose of the role that an API plays in most cases. If you think about being at a restaurant and you're sitting at your table, you want something from the kitchen. 
but you don't go back to the kitchen and the kitchen in this case would be think about the computer or system that you want to communicate with or tell to do certain things you don't go directly to the kitchen and say make this for me a server or a waiter or, or a waitress comes to your table and says what can i get for you and you know they'll usually they write something in shorthand and then they take it and punch it in and that tells the kitchen what to do you don't actually tell the kitchen what they should do the in most cases an api sir is serving the same role as that waiter or waitress coming to your table they're taking commands or information from you and acting as a broker to go to another system who will do what what it was told to do and then they bring it to you and that you can think of that as you making an api request the the api tells the server what to do and then it brings the response back to you so i think that's that's always been kind of helpful for me as an analogy um the next point an api is considered restful so you'll hear things referred to as a rest api that typically just means that it's a web api that the requests are sent over http um and in terms of the coders initiative if you do go back and review those materials or watch any of the videos we may refer to uh, the rest api or the tsc uh, tsc uh, in general terms when referring to this but uh, the tsc is the python interface that tableau provides to interact with the rest api so if you are if you're rever reviewing some materials and you hear both terms in general we are talking about the same thing so talking about tableau's rest api specifically so I work with a lot of APIs at work and outside of work, and um, even though there's a lot, Tableau's REST API is very well documented when it comes to, you know, if I compare it to some others that I've worked with. Uh, there's a big long list that I've uh, mentioned, or sorry, that I've linked down here of all the things that you can do with the Tableau REST API. Um, it's, it's very long, um, but there the documentation is very good. It has examples. It has uh, what the, what errors might mean things like that. Um, so definitely, if you're looking to do certain things, uh, you, you definitely want to start there. Um, I talked about a, a little bit about authentication, um, like some, like a lot of APIs deal in tokens instead of usernames and passwords. Um, if that's something that's important to you or something that's required, you know, in your industry or at your job, it does support both. Um, it accepts XML uh, or JSON, which are just kind of two web format ways of formatting requests. Um, however, I just like to call out that most of the documentation examples that you find are in XML. Um, there are a ways, there are ways in Python to convert between the two seamlessly, um, but just as a heads up, I am someone who actually prefers JSON most of the time, but I kind of make do with XML in, in Tableau most of the time, because if I run into a problem, then what I'm seeing is, is not one-to-one. -one. So, uh, I would encourage you to check out those two links. Um, just kind of an overview of the of the API in general, and then um, the second link is a list of every every call, every method that the the Tableau's REST API supports. So let's talk a bit, a little bit about um, the art of the possible here. So um, I want to, I, I just want to point out. Um, that some of the things that you could do, some of the things that we actually have done um, at, at JPMC and uh, things that I've seen outside of the environment um, that sometimes people don't think of. We think of like, oh, you know, I can automate one thing, but you might think about chaining all these things together and the result that you, you, you could get. Um, and then after that, I'm going to jump into some practical examples and just kind of show you what it looks like when you start building some of these things. So an onboarding application. So one of the problems that we had at, uh, at JPMC when onboarding new Tableau projects is just how long it took. And, and, and this is, there are some probably financial industry specific things going on here, but just the way we have to manage permissions, the, the groups that have to be created, all the requests that have to be submitted by the user in order to wind up with just a project on Tableau server. Uh, it took about three or four weeks uh, for for uh, for someone from submitting the request until they were actually able to log in and start publishing and having users view their content. Um, we built an onboarding application that now gets that all of that done in about 15 minutes. Um, but in the Tableau specific things that are happening happening there is, you know, within and then and all of this happens within a matter of seconds because these are some of the last things that happen 
is we sign in, we create the site or the project, we add, we create a group, we add users, we give them permissions, and then we sign out. That's all done just with one set of commands. And as soon as that's done, the user has access. Um, it's not someone going into the, you know, to the project and clicking permissions and then adding a group and giving it the red and the green and red boxes. Um, this is just something that we can tell your users or our users um, hit submit and later today you can use this project. Um, another possibility that, that we have implemented um, that is probably relevant to um, if you're in an environment where there are strong controls between uh, deploying things to production, for example. So if you have a pre-production environment, you have to go through a bunch of steps or you have to submit a request first in order to move something into production. Well, we address that concern of our users um, by uh, creating a, a deployment application where essentially the users come to a UI that we built that queries from Tableau and shows them their projects that they have access to. Uh, then they can select items that they want to deploy. They, if we need information about credentials, so like if it's a, if it's a connection that requires a password, or if they want to change the server value as they go from one environment to the other, you know things like that. Um, we we collect those inputs from them. Then we automatically create uh, the request that's required for us. And then as soon as the user's approver approves that request, we deploy the item. So the user isn't able to do it themselves directly in production, but we've made it so that the delay is so short between them submitting it and deploying it that it's not really a pain point anymore. When these were completely manual requests, our SLA for our users was five business days. And if you think about that, that's a really long time to push out a just if it's just a simple dashboard change. Um, so this is this deployment application is where when Heather referred to millions of hours saved, this is where the meat and bones of that is because we do somewhere between, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong here, the last time I looked, somewhere between 100 and 200 deployments a day to production. Yep, that's yeah. correct. So if you think if you times all of those by five business days, we really are, you know, it really starts to blow up that number. So um, automated cleanup is another good example um, and one that I've uh, had uh, conversations outside of work uh, with folks as well, wanting to find a better way to do this. So using um, the REST API to query workbooks, data sources, projects, even sites uh, that no one's logged into for 90 days or no one's viewed in 90 days, whatever your cutoff is, and then automatically deleting them or uh, placing them. We've seen someone did a, an archive project where they didn't delete them, but they just moved them into another project and then notify the users like, hey, if you have anything in this project, it'll be purged after some other cutoff. So lots of different things you can do. If you have a need to automate something in Tableau, you, you can do it, you can find a way to do it. So I wanna jump now and show you just uh, some examples of um, some of the things that you can do just to get started. And then we'll look at something a little bit more complex, but that kind of shows a bigger picture. So. Before I drag this over, I discovered earlier today that something has changed in uh, Tableau Cloud, and I am no longer able to authenticate with tokens, so I have to do it with a password, but I don't want to show my password, so let me drag this over. Okay, let me come out of this screen really quick. Okay, so this is Postman. This is the tool I was referring to before uh, a little bit earlier. And what I'm doing here is uh, putting a request together uh, and I am going, expecting Tableau Server to respond to me. So uh, it's a little bit outside of the scope of this conversation for today, uh, but we do go into more detail on some of these things in these like second and third videos in the series. Um, there are different methods that you use when you're making requests to an API. Um, the most common are get and post, and get is essentially saying, give me something, and post is saying, I'm going to give you something, and then you respond. So this is just a very basic example of how you log in to the Tableau REST API using um, XML in this case. Um, this is probably, this is the first thing that you'll have to do for just about any anything, uh, any uh, method that you call, you'll need to be logged in so that Tableau knows 
whether or not you are entitled to do what you're asking to do. Uh, and you can see here that uh, this is a pretty simple request. Uh, it's just asking me for my credentials, which I've masked here, uh, and then the name of my site. And this is the site that was assigned to me when I signed up for the sandbox. Uh, so once I run that command, or sorry, once I send this command, which I'm not going to do now because I took this out, uh, but, but, but before I shared this screen, I ran it, and Tableau responds with this token. And we can see this long kind of random looking token here. Um, and that is a token that Tableau issued to me uh, after authenticating um, that I need to include in subsequent requests so that Tableau knows that I'm authenticated. And to give an example of that, if I switch over here, this endpoint called sites, site ID workbooks allows me to get all of the workbooks within a site. Um, and uh, you know you can think of lots of different reasons why that, that might be useful. Um, but let's see, if I send it without this header, and headers, you can kind of think of metadata going along with a request. And when you're dealing in tokens, like this kind of thing with API, uh, those are typically passed along in the header. So if I try to hit this, even though I just authenticated in, a, in another request, if I try to hit this endpoint, without that header, then it comes back and tells me, well, unauthorized access. You know, it makes sense. We would kind of expect that. So if I then use this X Tableau auth header and put in this token that it gave me a few minutes ago, then I get back the list of workbooks that I would expect. And you can see in here, um, it's there's there's kind of a lot in here, but I get information like the LUID, the name, uh, the content URL, uh, whether tabs are shown, uh, things about the project, uh, the what the location, the owner, um, and uh, all, all this different kind of information in here. So you can start to see how we can start querying against the the API and getting results uh, that are that we might want to investigate. You know, like I said earlier, things that haven't been used uh, would be a, a different call. But um, this we can show another one here how you can filter with the API. So the API, the endpoint. This is called, and I should have said this first. Um, whenever you're hitting an, an API like API like this, uh, you will, will, you'll hear these referred to as an endpoint or a route. Uh, it might be another name that you would hear for these. Um, but essentially, that's the address that you're going to send the request to and how the uh, the API knows what to do and how to respond. So if you compare the two here, this one, I just did a, I just hit this workbooks endpoint with nothing after it, and it just returned everything to me. Well, let's say I want to filter by, uh, I want to find something specific. Um, I can filter by name or owner or things like that. I want to find something that uh, this one user owns uh, or or anything like that. Now, if I send along this, I need to update. See, I get this authorization again, uh, author, unauthorized access, and that's because this token is outdated. So as soon as I update this, now I get a filtered list of results. Now I get only that workbook that I wanted. Um, and you can, again, you can see how you can start using filters to find specific things. And then you look in the REST API and there's commands to delete objects and things like that. So you can start chaining multiple things together uh, in order to accomplish your needs. So now I'm gonna jump over to VS Code and show you a little bit more about what, what these things look like in, in a coding environment. Um, and hopefully these uh, don't look, I don't think any of these should look too, uh, intimidating um, because we're really just sending some very basic and if you don't if you're not that familiar with python don't worry for now um, these are just some some very basic examples uh, of, of how you would sign in and things like that so we can see this is that same request body that i that you see in postman just written in python if i go here you've got the same structure I've got my username and password extracted out into another file so I can show you this and then my site name. And so if I just run this file where I'm just signing in, you will see I get the same result. 
I have a token embedded in here, and I can use a function like this, get token from that response, and then pass that token on response after response um, to kind of accomplish a larger goal. So in the in the in the interest of today's uh, session, one thing that I want to show as like a this is an art of the possible thing you can string together is we can create a project on the server, create a group, create a user, add the user to the group, give the group permissions to this brand new project and upload a workbook all in one chain of events. So I've got a, a different function written out here for each one, but let's just kind of show what this flow looks like. And so I'm, you can kind of see this is my function that runs it all together. So I'm going to first create the project, then create the group, give permissions to the group, add a user to the group, publish the workbook, and then refresh it. So if I run this, I have a, I have some steps in here to allow manual input, but obviously you could automate this uh, with input from a database or from a user, a user interface um, if you didn't want the user to have to, to type anything in. But in this case, we'll just call this uh, Columbus Tug. Hit enter. Next thing it wants for me is a group name. So we'll just call it Tug Users. And it created the group for me. And the next is uh, a user. And I'm going to use Zach in this case because I know his email address and I know he already has access to my site. So if I enter in his email there, added user to a group, published the workbook, and then initiated the refresh. And if I jump over to my Tableau online, I can see here's the project I just created. There's the workbook that I threw in it. If I go and look at permissions, there's a group called Tug Users, and Zach is in it. And he has permissions to view this because, you know, I don't want Zach touching anything. That's always dangerous. Um, so I know that was fast, and I really encourage uh, everyone to go back if you're interested in learning uh, about the, the ins and outs of some of the stuff that we looked at today to, to check out the first couple of videos in the series where we really dive in. Um, I mean, those that's two, three hours worth of material. Um, and I know I, this was a little bit condensed, um, but I would love to answer any questions that folks might have, or if there was anything um, that we'd like to see again, or what if questions, how to questions. Uh, I'd love to open it up for that. And while people are thinking, Kyle, one thing, um, unless I miss it, you didn't really talk much about the developer program in Tableau, right? Um, and how you can get like a sandbox site that might be worth mentioning. I did. I started with that, actually. Okay. All right. So I missed that. But to <laughs> no, reiterate, I'm... since in case, just in case anyone else missed it, um, am I still sharing? No, I stopped sharing. Um, it's If you visit, to, I'll just do this. If you visit Tableau.com. We still developer. see your screen. We still see oh, your screen. Oh, you can? Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. So Tableau.com slash developer. Uh, and it, and I can, I can jump back out there again. Uh, and this is what you'll see when you land here. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of documentation about all the different tools and APIs and software development kits. There's events, community. But what we're really interested in for the these purpose for the this purpose is this developer sandbox. Um, and you can request a new one. Um, if I click existing, it'll take me into the one that I just had. Um, Tableau just asks you for a little bit of information, but this is it's totally free. You're not obligated to you know expand or buy anything after a certain amount of time. Um, and like I said, it's usually within about mm, 15 minutes or so because uh, I'm sure they have some process running to provision these projects. Uh, and then you'll get an email with instructions on how to log in. Um, you know these are these projects. Uh, sorry, these sites are meant for development and research and things like that. You you only get like one creator license and one explorer license. It's not something that you could use in any practical sense for your end users, um, it, but it does give you an opportunity to play around in a server that you know you won't accidentally cause any harm to any production data or anything like that. Any, let's see. 
Somebody called out IDE like Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jupyter's, I, I enjoy Jupyter for uh, certain use cases. Um, it's much more run, run a chunk at a time and evaluate and then write your next uh, command or, or call. Um, and sometimes if you want to string it together, you extract it out of a notebook, but um, that's also great. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Scott Eaton. <laughs> he is one of our heavy users of the application that we talked about internally. Uh, can you explain how Postman is useful? You did not seem to need it in the demo to use VS Code. That's that's a great uh, call out, um, Jorge. Um, Postman would be, or was very useful as I was putting this file together. So as I was going through and um, stringing things together uh, to make you know multiple calls like this, that should be this example, um, it's easy. It makes it easier to fire off a single command and see how the server responds. Now, to your point, you could do all pretty much all of this in a terminal, just within VS Code or Windows or uh, Mac, whichever you're using the plain vanilla terminals there. The good thing about Postman is it's it's just a graphical UI uh, for investigating headers, um, you're changing between content types and seeing if that makes a difference if you're working with an API maybe that you don't know very well. Um, but yeah, you you could get away with with without using Postman, but I think you would find that most developers would probably agree that uh, when you're when you're trying to still figure everything out, you do it in Postman and then when you're ready, you know what your calls look like and and you're ready to commit them to code then you put them in, into, your, into your actual IDE. Uh, Zhao Ping asked, are there any training videos or program on this internally at Chase, something like Tableau Academy? So we have talked before about um, expanding our um, kind of, I guess, learning resources for development type stuff uh, with internally. However, most of what we would cover and most of the methodology, uh, you know, about things that are specific to Tableau are going to be the same. So I think probably most of our focus would be on those things via the Tableau Coders Initiative, which obviously we invite everybody to join, uh, no matter what your level ex of experience might be at this point, um, because pretty much anything Tableau related that we cover in one of those sessions is going to carry over internally as well. Now, if you have specific chase related headaches or questions, we're also happy to talk with you about those internally. Uh, I just won't go into that here, obviously. Yeah, and I mean, the Tableau Academy was always kind of average, so we, we, we might get rid of it. <laughs> The, the joke there for anybody that missed that is, is Heather, uh, that used to be on Kyle and I's team, if you missed it earlier, has since left. She's still on the line here in one of the leads for the Columbus tug. So that's the joke there. <laughs> Heather's being awfully quiet. <laughs> that was a joke for an audience of two. <laughs> it worked, though. You laughed, Kyle. <laughs> I, did. I did. You got me. I think, you know, Scott probably got it. It was maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Um, and I know that with something like this, it might feel intimidating to ask a question if you're brand new. Um, but um, my my tw Twitter is up in your business. Uh, it's on the slides that I'll ha ask Zach to share as well. Uh, my G my Gmail is just firstname.lastname at gmail.com. I'm on Slack. Um, I'm you feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is I love helping people with this kind of stuff um, just because it helps me reinforce what I already what I think I already know and sometimes what I don't. Um, and I, I don't always get a chance to uh, talk about this stuff very much at work, uh, just with the way our environment works. So if you're feeling uh, if you want to rest on it or watch the the cup first couple videos and then reach out totally understand um, or just random message. I'm happy to do that too. And the only thing I'd emphasize with Kyle is, um, you know, Kyle did a good job of condensing this in from like a five hour set of videos to like 30 minutes. So if this did get you interested, check out those links you had mentioned. And um, as Kyle mentioned toward the beginning, we were going to kickstart this again and have kind of a second series outside of the REST API. But just emphasize Kyle's put it, done a lot of work into this and it's all out there on YouTube. Definitely worth watching. 
Awesome. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining today and to our two presenters, Kyle and Jeffrey. Um, hopefully you guys found value out of this. We are going to schedule our next event probably around the same time frame in September. Um, so be on the lookout for the invites for that. Again, thank you for joining. And if you have any questions, put them in the chat. If not, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending. Thank you, everybody.